year I was born, uh, Denise Griffin Johnson, 1958. Can you describe what life was like in West Baltimore? Yeah, I tell you, uh, I like to, to, to think and believe and know that I had a cultural experience. Uh, if you if you notice the uh, buildings, uh, three-story row homes, five-bedroom houses, people had large families, and so I'm the last of seven children. Uh, it's five girls and uh, two boys. So I like to think that I, I you know, uh, I had a family that was a community because it was seven seven of us. And uh, we we had our row house and we had our steps and and um, other families there they had a lot of children too so it was a lot of play we we had an opportunity to just play um, as children and um, then when we became teenagers um, still had opportunities to play you know on a Saturday it was like five parties that you could go to. And I still like to dance. I don't dance like I used to because I'm trying to find a spot to dance. But I grew up dancing. We grew up in a household where we danced, where we, we, we sung songs. We grew up Pentecostal. And if you know anything about Pentecostal, I like to say we rock the house. It's all about movement and the instruments. And, you know, you do your prayer and whatever. But you definitely vibe into the, uh, the sound of, of instruments and you're feeling that, so you, you create that movement. So the church provided that avenue, household music. I grew up um, hearing stories. My mother and my father um, told, told us stories. Um, my family's from West Point, Mississippi. They had to endure Jim Crow. Um, my father left Mississippi, one. He wanted to stay alive. Two, they were farmers um, from a family of hunters and farmers. He wanted more for his children. This is what he told us. He wanted more for his children other than farming, and then he wanted to uh, also live uh, during that period of time. It was nothing for um, for uh, a black men to, to face death. My, my father told the story that um, he's walking in his community West Point, Mississippi is a rural area. It's a small town. And he's walking, and a woman, a white woman, uh, she's attracted to him, or whatever word you want to use. And he keeps walking, and she says to him, you know I can call rape. And he said he almost got strung up. And he said that was the moment when he realized he had to leave Mississippi. So I like to think that my father had a lot of courage to um, decide to make a decision that I'm either going to die with bullshit or I'm going to use my courage and face death in war. And my father was, was a group of the uh, Buffalo Soldiers, that group that only fought in the European War. And it was that big battle that lasted over 200 days. And uh, he came home a, a different man. That's what our mom said. And I think it was the reason why um, they broke up. Back then they called it shell shock. Now it's PTSD. Yeah. Um, and so he shared with us the horrors of being in war. Uh, what he had to endure. He was a sergeant. Most of his platoon got killed. Uh, he had to use their bodies so that he could live. He had to be on the uh, shore, covered up with dead bodies, not having food to eat, insects all over his body. So that can't help but create trauma in your mind and disrupt your soul, let's say. And so uh, he and my mother didn't make it in marriage, but during that time, according to history, uh, World War II um, created the GI Bill, which uh, somewhere in, in the literature talks about uh, a vehicle that helped to create the middle class. So that was the reason my father went to war, to take advantage of the GI Bill. 
um, they bought property in Dundalk in a black neighborhood that still exists called Turner Station. Uh, Henrietta Lacks, if you're familiar with her story, that's where she, she was from. And that's when they left Mississippi. Um, they moved uh, into Turner Station, broke up, and my mother came to West Baltimore, and my father followed her. And he said the only reason why he followed her is because he wanted his children to have access uh, to him. So uh, growing up doing segregation, and it was segregated during the time that I was growing up, and the beautiful thing about it is that there was wholeness. So if you look at the landscape, and this landscape was here before black folks inhabited the space. If you look at the landscape, every intersection has a business front. And so therefore there were a lot of small businesses, there were movie theaters, there were skate rinks, there were bowling alleys. Uh, you really didn't need to leave your, leave the community for anything. And the primary place to uh, buy uh, fresh fruits and vegetables was Lexington Market. And at that time, I can still see the picture, right? At that time, um, Lexington Market had um, an open market that went all the way up to Martin Luther King Boulevard. So you had local farming happening in the city at that time. And most people don't know that who got rid of local farming in the city of Baltimore was government. Government got rid of local farming. Um, and my mother, she used to be, she used to feel so good to go to Lexington Market and, 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 and purchase her uh, fresh fruits and, and, and vegetables because they were farmers, right? They knew what was fresh and, you know, it was a great thing. And so another cultural piece of folks coming from the uh, South uh, during the Great Migration is that everybody had a freezer. So you would go and you would get your fresh fruits and vegetables, you would pre-cooked stuff, and you would put it in your freezer. Same thing you would do with your, your meat. You would buy, buy the meat that was butchered and you would freeze it. So whenever you wanted to eat, you had, you had uh, good food to eat. And so your, your, your regular small business stores, you would go there to buy potato chips, you buy candy, get sugar, so on and so forth. You didn't, you didn't buy your major food from the, the small businesses at the uh, intersection. Um, and the whole idea is still people that, that uh, have freezers. My sister most recently, she only had one child, she kept a freezer. And I would say, why do you still have a freezer? It's just you, right? But that practice of purchasing your, your fresh food, free cooking it, putting it in your, in your freezer and just taking it out your freezer and, you know, cooking your meal. So learning how to, to preserve food. And so... I have a disconnect with that whole um, idea of a food desert. I'm not sure where it came from, why it was named that, because it will have people think that in the community there are no markets, and that's not true. There, there are multiple markets in the uh, community, and then people have, and for the community of West Baltimore, there were never major markets. So when people say, oh, it's a food desert, there's no mom say, well, there's never been major markets in West Baltimore. What are people talking about, right? But I understand that people will develop things from their own orientation and their own experience. But it's always interesting when people start to repeat it and um, start to believe it, um, which uh, for me is a way of like boxing people in. Um, but get to the next question, because I think I went someplace else. <laughs> So um, I had two children, and um, I was married. Marriage didn't work out. Um, so, you know, I'm doing the work thing, uh, having to work. Um, my, my first job, this was before I had children. I used to volunteer at the community center in Sandtown, Winchester. I used to do uh, tutoring. I, I used to tutor, tutor people. 
and the uh, lady Ella Johnson, who 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 was my mentor. She was uh, doing community development work in, in Sandtown, Winchester. And if you go in Sandtown, Winchester, and you see anything that looks really good, that's her work. Um, so she asked me if I would be uh, interested in becoming an organizer, and this was you know, before becoming a mother. And I said, why not? So she taught me about square block organizing. Uh, and uh, initially I entered into organizing as is uh, traditionally defined, where it's about the issue. Crime, sanitation, infant mortality, uh, anything that you can think of related to the human existence where uh, it's not enough of, there's a lack of. So that's the kind of organizing that, that I was doing. Um, so she taught me some things and uh, I learned some things and uh, I was making a little bit of money and it was right in the community. It was a win-win and, and, and I learned that I was really good at it. So time goes on, I marry, I go to school, I finish school, have children, things don't work out, and you know, I got to do the, the career thing in my mind, right? I make some money now, right? I make some real money. And um, so the 80s, the 80s is when I started to notice the change in the community. And that was the crack cocaine era, where crack was, uh, according to what's in the literature, crack was put upon just about all urban areas, just like fentanyl has been put in just about every place, rural areas too. And so women always took care of the household, uh, took care of the children, so on and so forth. But the crack cocaine era changed everything because women started using crack. And uh, families started falling apart. And uh, like I said, I'm from a family of seven, so my sisters and I, we would get together and talk about what was happening, what was going on, and trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Things are changing so much. And at that time, I think I was working at, um, I think I was working at Mercy Medical Center. I was managing their um, family homeless program. I thought I wanted to be a clinical person, so that's why I was doing that work, trying to, trying to think of something that would give me a sense of security, whatever that means, right? But that's that's how I was thinking back then. And so. Um, I recall having to talk with the, uh, the chief of the emergency room. She was a woman. And she wanted to meet with me because I'm, I'm doing homeless, I'm managing you know, homeless families and all of that. And she says, I'm trying to understand what is going on. And I said, my sisters and I, we're trying to understand the same thing. Because she noticed the same thing that we noticed, the number of women showing up at Mercy Medical Center emergency room, just all messed up off the crack cocaine. And uh, I remember one lady in particular, and this is like the danger or the evilness or the sickness, whatever other words you can think of, that impacts family drugs. I remember a lady that uh, I grew up with, she lived on Stricker Street. And when I went back to work after having my son, she had a son that had been like eight months older than my son. And I didn't want to do daycare, because I did daycare with my daughter. I didn't want to do daycare. And I asked her if she could uh, babysit my son. And I was still working in the community, working at Lafayette Square at that time, I believe. And so she agreed, and so, we were friends, and you know, friends talk about a lot of different things, including romance and interests and things like that. And she told me a story. She said that she was interested in this man. He's in prison. And he was in prison for dealing drugs. And she said, um, I don't like 
what he's in prison for. I just don't trust that. I don't like that. And then she asked me what did I think. I said, well, you, you answered your question. You don't like that he, he dealt drugs. So, you know, this, this, the decision is yours. So anyway, I, I am coming home from work. And she decided to, I guess, to pursue the relationship. And I'm coming home from work. She had two, two children. They was older than my son. And then another one that was about maybe, I don't know, maybe he was 12. And a lot of stuff was going on in uh, her staircase. And I'm like, shit, she did it. So I go and I get my son and just tell her I'm not coming back. But um, it hurts me to this day to know what happened to a great woman and her children. And what happened is that she ended up getting addicted to crack. She lost her son. Um, somebody else had to take care of the one that was uh, eight months older than my son. And I recall seeing her at uh, Mercy. Health wasn't that good. And she said that you know she lost the children. They're not doing good, so on and so forth. I share that story because that is the kind of impact that drugs have on families and it has on us. Uh, communities and she she stayed out she stayed out being high and addicted for a lot of years um and i haven't seen her since then um so that is when i started to see the decay in the community and that is when um, i decided to try to find a way to sort of like get back in there and try to i don't know do something um so the 80s was a big change in West Baltimore crack cocaine. Thank you, yeah. and thank, and thank you for sharing that. Um, talk a little bit about the work you're, you're doing right now, which is, I think is amazing work. West Baltimore, it's about reimagining the community, redevelopment. Um, so if you could talk a little bit about the work you're doing right now. So I call myself a cultural organizer, and I shared, shared with you all that I was, I was trained in, in organizing. I'd like to also add that I got formal education. I did postgraduate work because I thought I wanted to be a, a clinical person. Um, I was, I've was i always been a curious person. Uh, my undergraduate degree is in science, so I've always asked questions. I've always thought about things. Uh, I love experimentation. Um, I love interacting uh, with people. Um, so. After raising my children and um, finishing all of the postgraduate courses that I needed to just sit and take the test to become a clinical practitioner, <laughs> it was crazy. I decided, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I spent all of that money and all that time. I said, oh my God, I don't want to do that. I don't want to treat people. I don't want to diagnose people. I don't want to label people. I just want to work with people. So I was seeking, and I, I, my mind said, okay, what, what were you doing before you became a mother? And I said, well, I was organizing, and I enjoyed it, and I was really good at it. So I said, let me see if I can find an opportunity in that. It was just me. You know, my children grown. It was just me. So I did. I found an opportunity uh, to do, I think the title was Project Director with Bon Secours. Uh, community works and I met a visual artist and he had done his um, graduate micro thesis on the highway to nowhere and I walked into one of his meetings and he was talking about the highway to nowhere and I said wow this is interesting I never heard anybody talk about it publicly we always talked about it amongst ourselves but never publicly. And I realized that that was a part of my story. So he had this, his thesis was really fantastic. Uh, he, a visual artist, I mean a great visual artist. Uh, he had uh, a lot of interesting things laid out in his paper. And one of the fascinating things for me was all of the years living in the community, seeing the highway to nowhere, I could never visualize anything other than what is there. 
And here this man gave me a vision. I was like, wow. So he wanted to do, I call it movement work. He wanted to do this big movement of change. So I was the project director. And I said, okay, it could be one of the projects that we can work on together. And so we did, and it became, um, it became an action. We called it Culture Works, uh, where we agitated in public. He had the in our, in artist mentality, for example, there's nothing in this community. There are no galleries. It doesn't have this. It doesn't have that. And I say, hey, the culture's with the people. It's not with the bricks and mortar. You know, you got to interact with the people. So we're trying to move things forward. Um, create something on the highway to nowhere that has meaning for, for the community. We did story circles. Uh, we were able to engage. If my father was living, he would be like 110 years old. So during that time, we were able to engage um, some of the older people in the community that were in the 80s. And um, the heart tugging, tugging thing about uh, collecting those stories at that time, people were still crying. The, all of those years, people were still crying about what they lost and how how the community had changed. But well, anyway, we were looking for resources, and uh, we stumbled on this group called Alternate Roots. They are an art activist group uh, in the South, and that includes Merlin. And we were telling them what we were doing, and it was a shared value. So they wanted to join us in the work. Um, and they did, and so it became a mutually benefiting partnership that was extremely difficult, a long collaboration that was extremely difficult, uh, but we were able to bring in a whole lot of artists into West Baltimore to create temporary art, to gather more stories, to, uh, I don't know, they just did some fantastic stuff as artists. Which caused me to say, I don't understand how, how you all can create all this wonderful stuff, but y'all are broke, right? I, I just couldn't understand. You all, you can actually produce something, whereas me, I just think about stuff. But you all can actually produce stuff that people will buy, but you don't have any money. I don't understand that. But in our work together, what we did was merge uh, culture and organizing together. And I became a cultural organizer as a result of that. And the work was using cultural organizing as a mobilizing piece and then integrating the arts into the organizing and using artists as community artists to be able to reflect our values through theater, through visual arts, through performance arts so on and so forth. And that is what we did when we had a national festival on the highway to nowhere. We did theater, we did performance art, we did uh, visual arts. I still have, have some, uh, some of that information. And um, I guess the most amazing piece, just being a part of all that movement. And um, I like to also add, people in West Baltimore have no idea how many people know about West Baltimore from that work because we had an opportunity to go a lot of different places to talk about what we were doing uh, in West Baltimore. And I further learned that in this country, there are people that value place, people that value belonging, people that value connections, people that value culture, people that, and they are working hard to amplify it. So that was like my big learning curve, and that was, uh, I guess, the introduction of me better trying to define what I'm gonna do as a cultural organizer, right? So that was uh, my, my pivoting, let's say, to um, doing the work that, that I'm currently doing. I hope that wasn't too long. No, no, no I'm, <laughs> I'm glad you made the choices you made. Um, so what do you think that the Highway to Nowhere should be redeveloped into? What would be your, your choice and your thought of your vision for that space? Well, uh, you all uh, met um, Tony Hutchison, who, who, you know, is an economist. And so I think last year this time we did a uh, discussion about that. And uh, he came up with the concept of human flourishing. And so for me, it connected to the earlier work 
that we did. We had 52 acres of unused space. And it's, it has been unused for over 50 years. How can that space benefit people in a meaningful way? And now this moment that we're in, I'm amazed that you have so much focus on that space now. You have um, a project uh, where they, they have to widen the tunnel because they're making faster trains. And that's a 10 year project of digging. So the community is going to use a playground and then we lease houses. Um, you're going to have tunneling for 10 years, which is going to upset old structures because these structures are over 100 years old. Um, the governor announced that no, we're going to do the red line. Um, and then you have the city and the federal government trying to do reconnected communities, West Baltimore United. So for me, it's like you have all these pieces come together, somewhat synchronized, somewhat. At least city and state are talking to one another. And our senator, Senator Antonio Hayes, he has agitated Amtrak to make sure that they engage with the community in a different way other than what they originally started to engage the community. Um, so it's like this is our moment. And if this is our moment, what is the real strategy of bringing all of these pieces together in, in, in an intentional way where it can actually make a difference for the community and for the city of Baltimore. It's like this is our opportunity, but how do you influence that? How do you get at the table and bring all of these entities together to be intentional about a strategy that can make a difference for the community and impact the whole city of Baltimore? So I guess my hope is that a real strategy gets developed. That is a great answer. Um, so as we are here in the Historic Hall of Theater, do you have any memories of the theater and do you have any hopes for the theater's use uh, uses in the future? Well, this was one of the places uh, that was part of our playground growing up. Uh, so, you know, it's a theater, movie theater, so there was seating and we always sat on the right side. We had our own seats. So we were a little, uh, what's the word, thuggish and bullies. So we come in, people sitting, they needed to move because this is what we did every Sunday. It's like this is our space. <laughs> and they would move. <laughs> so I really think that um, between my parents and coming to the movie theater every Sunday is the reason why I love stories now. And I still go to the movies. And I get so much pleasure watching a, a, a movie. And I think it's from the, my orientation of, of growing up. So Harlem Theater is a place that we, we went every Sunday uh, to watch a movie. And of course, at that time, you had multiple movies to watch. We had a cartoon. Um, and you could uh, watch the movie several times. You didn't have to just watch it one time. The hot dogs were good. The popcorn was good. Um, we knew the, the people that, that ran the place. We were pretty much respectful because that was the uh, expectation. You had to be respectful. Uh, that was the cultural piece. You, know, you, had to, you had to respect your elders. You had to listen. Um, you had to adjust your behavior when you were around adults. You just had to do that. That was the expectation. Um, so we had to behave a certain way once. And of course, when we got with ourselves, we behaved any way we wanted to. So we had, we had to do that piece. Uh, so that's my memory of the Harlem Theater. It was one of our playground pieces. Uh, one of the things that we did weekly was going to the movies, uh, enjoying theater. Um, so I'm happy that Angela Francis is um, on an operator. I like her vision. I want to participate uh, in her vision and be able to use the Harlem Theater as a gem in the community. And I call it Reclaiming Cultural Spaces. That's how I named it. When I talk about the cultural organizing piece, hey, we're reclaiming cultural spaces. That's what we're doing. And so I want to be able to um, galvanize resources, have conversations, uh, be able to influence um, 
what happens in the community. I want our voices to be loud enough or smart enough so that what we're saying, people will listen to it and it makes sense. Uh, so yeah, that's the way I am right now. I like how you said that, loud enough and smart enough. Um, so I got my last question for you. Um, what is one thing you wish people who did not live in this community knew about your community? So when we did the um, when we did the organizing work, the community came up with an expression that became our guiding principle and behaviors. Uh, they even defined culture. And the expression that I still use today when I'm trying to do a narrative, trying to get some money, trying to convince somebody of something, I, I use the expression of remembrance, healing, and celebration. Uh, so even for me, a woman of age, when I talk about having a cultural life in, in, in West Baltimore, it's that remembrance of what community looked like, what it felt like, what I learned. I like to say my swag came from growing up in West Baltimore. My carriage came up from having the parents that I, I had along with growing up in community where people will call you out. People will call you out, people will give you boundaries, and you, you had to learn to stand up. It was, it was expected that, that you learn to to stand up. And another piece culturally is that um, we associated with one another by our family names and the school that we went to. So that expression of homegirl and homegirl, homeboy is about, oh yeah, you went to Douglas High School, oh you went to, oh, you went to Walbrook, oh, oh you went to Cobb, oh you're Griffin, oh you're William, so you're cool, I know your family, so on and so forth. So that's how we interacted with one another and, and, and associated families with last names in the school that they went to. And so culturally speaking, in the time that we're in, I just find it real interesting. I don't know what it's research. I don't know. It's a different kind of thinking. For me, it's a different kind of thinking. So back then, you pretty much went to his own school. And I know population has changed uh, based on his own schools. But the city now uh, has, uh, I forgot the term, you go to any school you want to, they choose your application, right? And so what does that do that takes away, I call it a cultural edge of community? Because you're no longer associating with people where you live, you're associated with people all across the city of Baltimore. And the city of Baltimore doesn't have busing, so people have to use public transportation. So your extra curriculum, that school pride suffers. Who's going to show up at basketball games? There are no basketball games. Who's going to participate in track and field? There is no track and field. Who's going to do choir? There is no choir. And so even the school that I went to, Walbrook High School, it does not exist anymore. So when you talk about heritage, and you talk about culture, you talk about place, and people make decisions to take all of that away from you. I felt good about going to Walbrook High School. It was a new school in 1974. It had its first graduating class, which was 1,000 seniors. At that time, the school system would graduate that number of people. And it was a language arts school. Uh, so the emphasis was on um, the humanities and reading and, and writing and so on and so forth. And uh, whatever contribution you made to that school with an extra uh, curriculum activity, you won some kind of award or trophy that you know, we'll put, we put in a trophy case. Well, somebody dumped all of your stuff, right? Somebody just got rid of all of your stuff. So I just find that kind of interesting in terms of the thinking around what they've done with uh, public education. And it's no longer rooted in place anymore. It's, uh, I think it's citywide. You know, you just go to any school you want to. So I remember 
So uh, after the Baltimore uprising, I worked with uh, UNBC, um, Denise Margo. She got a whitey, I think it's a fellowship or something like that, to um, archive the Baltimore uprising. So I wanted to get community voices in her uh, archives. And uh, the media presented that Douglas High School was the culprit. And so I went to Douglas High School and we did stories and had conversations with the freshmen, the sophomores, the juniors, the seniors, and even the teachers. I forgot why I brought that up. Mm. I'm sorry, Miss Cindy now, maybe to come back. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot why I brought that up. It was a reason why I brought up. Oh, so yeah, here it is. So, um, Started off, hey, what neighborhood are you from? What community are you from? He said, well, I'm from, uh, I live in Charlie Hill. How long does it take you to get home into Douglas High School? It takes almost two hours. Well, what time do you get home? I can't do anything after school because I got to get home. That's an example of, uh, of what I mean by having that citywide mentality and schools are no longer uh, uh, a place where the community itself can get and interact with, with one another. They have taken all of that away and make it difficult. Although the idea may be a brilliant idea if you look at it one way, but culturally I think it's a, it's a terrible practice uh, that is in place. And then the transportation piece itself is challenging. So students will get penalized because they late as if they can control when the bus shows up. So I find it interesting too. But that's it for my critique. Well, Denise, Thank you. This has been good. You were the, the last interview today, but certainly not the least. So appreciate the time. Thank you. I appreciate what you all do. Thank you. Okay.